It says in the book of, not Ezra, in the book of Nehemiah, I'm sorry. Chapter 8, verse 4. You don't have to turn there unless you choose to. But it says, Ezra, the scribe, stood. Remind me of the platform at 3434. It says, Ezra, the scribe, stood on a high wooden platform that had been made for this occasion. High wooden platform. And as he stood before the people, he had 12. I can't call all their names, but if you look at that Ezra, Nehemiah chapter 8, he had 12. And I counted that and underlined it. I said, ooh. When he stood, 12 officials stood as well. And then it says in verse 5, Ezra stood, Nehemiah 8, 5, Ezra stood on the platform in full, full view of all the people. When they saw him open the book, they all rose to their feet. Some have asked, why do we stand? Because it's in the Bible. And the word of God was so rare in Old Testament time. And they were so blessed, my God, to have the law read to them. And any time the word, my God, was read, the people stood out of reverence to God's word. So now you have it. Nehemiah chapter 8. Verse 5, that's why we stand for God's reading. If you have your Bibles, please stand. Turn on your Bibles. I'll open up your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Genesis, the first Bible, I mean first book in the Scriptures, the first book in the Torah. Come on, somebody, and turn with me to chapter 32 as we stand in honor to God's Word. Genesis 32, starting at verse 22. When you have it, please say amen. amen. So during the night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two servant wives and his 11 sons and crossed the Jabbok River with them. After taking them to the other side, he sent over all of his possessions. After taking them to the other side, his family, his children, then he sent all of his possessions. Are you with me so far? Verse 24 says, This left Jacob all alone in the camp, and a man came and wrestled with him until the dawn break, began to break. When the man saw that he would not win the match, he touched Jacob's hip and wrenched it out of its socket. Then the man said, Let me go, for the dawn is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Jacob said, what is your name? The man asked. He replied, Jacob. Your name will no longer be Jacob. The man told him, from now on you will be called Israel because you have fought with God and with man and have won. Please tell me your name, Jacob said. And the angel said, why do you want to know my name? The man replied, then then he blessed Jacob there. Verse 30 says, Jacob named the place Peniel, which means face of God. For he said, I have seen God face to face, yet my life has been spared. The sun was rising and Jacob left Peniel and he was limping <laughs> because of the injury to his hip. Even today, people of Israel don't eat the tendon near the hip socket because of what happened that night when the man strained the tendon, tendon of Jacob's hip. Father, thank you for the word. As my wife covered me and spoke into my spirit, Father God, push deeper into my spirit, Lord. Pull greater revelation up out of my spirit tonight. Father God, I thank you for people that's ready to hear your word. Father God, the time that's allotted could not do this portion of scripture any justice. So Father God, say what you will. Move me out of the way and you get in the way. In Jesus' name we pray. Come on and say amen. amen. You may be seated in the presence of the king. Familiar portion of scripture, but there's great principles. That's why you can never get tired. Well, you should not never get tired of reading God's word because you can read a chapter every single day. And I promise you, if your spirit is alive, God will give you new revelation 
every time you read that chapter. Let me say that again as you focus. You can read the same chapter in the Word of God every single day, and God will give you different revelation if your spirit is alive from that same chapter, new revelation every single day that you read it. Because he just like that. God is so big. Never try to put God in a box. He won't fit. <laughs> Look at your name and say, he don't fit in a box. And so this is the second spiritual encounter of Jacob's life. The first was at a place called Bethel. <laughs> at Bethel, Jacob saw a ladder as God began to deal with him. At J-Book, he saw the Lord. At Bethel, Jacob became a believing man. At J-Book, he became a broken man. At Bethel, Jacob became a son of God. And then at Bethel, he died to a sin. See, it's one thing to give your life to Christ, son and women of God, but it's another thing to allow God to help you and I die to our sins. Because when we come to the Lord, we come in with all of our pain and all of our history, good, bad, and indifferent. But after you give your life to Christ, now you got to die. Mm, mm, mm. Mm, come on, somebody. He left Bethel with a spring in his step. He left Jacob with a forever, Jacob with a forever changed heart. But also his heart was changed. When he went, before he had this encounter, he was strutting. But his heart wasn't changed. He was dressed right, but his heart wasn't changed. He was singing worship songs, but his heart wasn't changed. He was being a porter, but his heart wasn't changed. He was being a greeter, but his heart wasn't changed. He was running the cameras, but his heart wasn't changed. He was working with the children, but his heart wasn't changed. He was working with the, come on somebody, but his heart wasn't changed. But when he encountered God, he went from strutting to limping, but he was a changed man. Just get that image, because some of us are strutting. But our heart ain't changed. And when I see you limping, if I see you crawling, then I know your heart might be changed. Come on, somebody. Or if you don't walk like you used to walk, come on, if you don't talk like you used to talk, you might have had an encounter with God. Come on, somebody. Uh, as I've always taught y'all, you can't meet a holy God if something not changed or die in your life. My God. He went in strutting, but he came out limping when he had a head on collision with God. You can't meet God and stay the same. So ask yourself, are you really having a head on collision with God because by now some things should be different appetite should be different hunger should be different desires shall be different as minister Robert told us when we come down my God we got to make sure that we ask God to kill our passion and our desires to sin and do wrong because you and I don't have to just deliberately sin and do wrong because Christ died so that you and I can be victorious over sin y'all missed that you don't have to sin because we was created in sin you can make a choice not to sin See, they don't teach you that. They just teach you, my God, that God know your heart. No, you don't have to sin. We choose to sin. Mm, mm, mm. The very thing that happened to Jacob needs to happen in the life of every believer. He spent the night talking with the Lord. And he was never the same. Oh, my God, I feel this one. Oh, my God, we're going to look at these verses. I'm going to give you some principles, and I'm going to get out your way. But the title of this sermon is, yeah, have a little talk with Jesus. Oh, y'all know it was coming. I've been speaking in the atmosphere. Come on, somebody look at your name and say, have a little talk with Jesus. Oh, you need it. You need it. That's why the encounter is called recharge. Because uh, some of us need to recharge. Some of us need to have a face-to-face -face encounter with God. My God, some of us need to have a little talk with Jesus. I'm talking about a real intimate talk. I'm not talking about a casual talk. I'm not talking about having a casual encounter with God. I'm talking about a real encounter with God like Jacob had. One that'll change your nature, one that'll cause you to limp, and one that'll change your name all at the same time. Somebody give God a hand. Oh my God, he's just like that. God is just powerful like that. He can change your name, change your heart, and change your nature. So point number one, I don't want to mess with it. Let's get, a little, let's, let's get to it. So, so Jacob was alone. Uh, see, to have a little talk with Jesus, you got to get alone, Sharon. Huh? Uh, it's good to get alone sometimes, but people uh, uh, dread getting alone because when you get alone, you got to really look at yourself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
uh, as I teach you, you, you can be anything to anybody, but when you get alone, now you got to deal with you and God. And he already know anyway, so you can't fool him. But Jacob was set up by God. To bring some context to the scripture, Jacob was set up by God. Uh, the Bible says that Jacob sent all of his, 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 his physical humanness, my God, for his wife and children and servants and all that. He told him to go on on the other side, and then he sent all of his livestock. Oh, my God, but he was left all alone. Yeah. How many, write this word down, divine set up. <laughs> uh, God got some of y'all set up. He wants you to get alone. I uh, can I help you write this down. God can't do what he want to do in your life, St Stacy, till you get really, till you get alone for real. When you're driving up and down that highway, my brother, get along with him, for real. Yes, yeah, so he can do what he need to do in your heart. Yes, sir. God is trying to get some of us alone. You know why? Because we depended on too much stuff. I could close the book right there. After he sent everything to the other side, it was just him and God. Oh, we holding on to too much. We depended on too much. Everything horizontal. We got to start depending on vertical. God is trying to get some of you alone. That what you won't let go to. Come on, let go of God is pulling it. You pulling it back. God is pulling it. He said, I need that. I can't take you where you're going. And we steady holding on to stuff that God's saying, give it to me. Give it to me. So what you holding on to that God is asking for? Oh. Jacob was facing a serious time of testing. He had left his home behind. And he was about to face a brother he had wronged. Esau. Many years earlier, the fact that Jacob spent the night in prayer is evident from the book of Hosea, right? Hosea chapter 12, 4. Chapter 12, verse 4 in the book of Hosea. It says in, in Hosea, yes, he wrestled with the angel and won. He wept and pleaded for a blessing from him. There at Bethel, he met God face to face and God spoke. To him. Have anybody ever had a face to face with God? Have you, have, have you had a face to face with God where something in you died? Something in you shifted? Something in you broke? Jacob was wrestling, as we know, with an angel. As he entered this time of prayer, talking about Jacob, Jacob found himself very much alone. All he had was gone. I want to say that right there and teach him. Some of the things that we are holding on to, write this word down, God have need of it. Boy, stay with me, that's I'm going to miss you. Some of the very things that you and I are holding on to, God have need of it. So ask yourself this right here. What am I holding on to that I know is an interference with the will of God for my life? What, who, because it's going to come down to two things. What am I holding on to and who am I holding on to? That's interfering with progress. Interfering with my relationship with God. What is it? Who is it? What am I holding on to? God had Jacob set up beautiful. Son everybody across, son all of his livestock, livestock livestock across and then it was him and God all he had was gone his family his servant his livestock his wealth everything Jacob was forced my God to face God all alone now y'all remember I told y'all a lot of things that God give me Shemaine is my life it's something about that six by nine cell Tiki coming face to face all alone ain't nobody in there with you it's something about having an encounter with God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, a lot of people, mm -hmm, I may be talking about another church, but a lot of people, my God, I might be talking about this one too, to keep it on a dollar, is afraid, Mama Donna, to get alone. So we keep a whole lot of noise. Noise represents distraction. Uh, as I told y'all, even in the church, my God, because you hear a lot of emotionalism, a lot of excitement, and a lot of noise don't mean it's the spirit of the living God. Some things are just noise. Come on, somebody. And so we got to begin to get all alone. God is trying to, prophetically speaking, God is trying to pull many of us, if not all of us, to some alone time. Some of you, you know, you're too busy. You got too much going on. And when it comes time to open up the scroll, when it comes time to open up the Constitution, when it comes time to lay out in the presence of the Lord, we tired, weary, and distracted. 
That means we're too busy. And God said, okay, my God, I'm going to suffer for a season. I'm going to be long-suffering. I'm going to be patient because that's what he is. But God is coming after that stuff that's distracting you. My God, because God trying to get you alone. My God, because God want to have a little talk with you because there's some things that he's trying to say to you. There's some things that he has to say to you for your next. And if you don't get it, my God, you're not going to be prepared to transition into your next. That's why you ought to thank God. My God, say, God, teach me how to rest in being alone because there's information and this impartation that I need straight from the heavens by God to prepare me to transition into my next. Quit being afraid to get alone. Quit being afraid to ask everybody to leave the room because you got to get along with God. Quit, my God, come on, y'all got to talk to me. Come on now. And so don't be afraid to get alone. I'm just trying to lay the story because many of us fight, my God, to keep people and things active and alive in the life of God. Say, no, get it to me. No, remove that. No, get that out your way. I'm trying to spend time with you. I'm trying to give you. I'm trying to down. Thank you, Holy Ghost. I'm trying to download in you for your next. If God, if you don't get what you need from God, you, you and I will not be prepared for our next season. You won't be prepared for your next promotion if you don't get what you need. So you need to get alone with God. God is trying to get us to get rid of all of the distractions. I preached to y'all what a month ago about death by distraction. A lot of stuff that we think we need ain't nothing but a distraction to a more intimate vibrant relationship with God. If you look at it, you don't really, I've, I've learned some valuable lessons in my former life and when I was locked up. It's a whole lot of stuff that we in society think we need. I survived almost four years off of oatmeal cakes, uh, 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 Roman noodles and, and, and Debbie's and stuff like that. So, you know what I'm saying? And a little small 13 inch TV. You didn't have no cell phone. My God, I didn't get to go everywhere and I was content. So, what am I trying to say? A lot of stuff that you think you need, you don't have to have. A lot of stuff that we have accumulated in the natural right now ain't nothing but distraction from keeping us from hearing from God. It's a lot of principles to be learned. So ask yourself, do I really need all that? Do I really need all that? Do I got to have three phones and an iPad? Mm -hmm. Do I have to always get the newest phone every time it come out? And I didn't even learn the last one before the new one came out. Mm, mm, mm. Yes, Lord. Many people fear this kind of loneliness. Remember my boss, former boss, Eddie Miller, told me, my God, that a lot of people can't handle being alone. So that's why they keep a lot of people. They like to host. They like to always throw parties. They like to always go where there's a lot of people at. Because a lot of people, my God, they want to host all the time. Always want to host people is afraid of getting alone. Now, we got some people that are social bugs, and we understand all that. I'm trying to keep it in the simplicity, my God, but a lot of people keep a lot of stuff going on because they're terrified of getting alone. Because when you get alone, now you got to deal with you. Now you got to come face to face with you. Now you can't blame her. Now you can't blame him. Now you can't blame that. Now you got to look at you, because when God gets you alone, he's trying to deal with you. He ain't trying to deal with everybody that's connected to you. As long as you keep it about everybody else, then it keeps you, it, what that is, it, you divert the real focus to everything but you. Mm-hmm. When you come face to face with God, my people fear that kind of intimacy with the Lord, as I stated. Yet the very thing they fear is the very thing they need the most in their lives. It come a time in life where some of the things that God has delivered you from and brought you out of, the Spirit of God, when you are ready, the Spirit of God will lead you back to come face to face with your past. Yeah. Key word, when you are ready, because some of us try to go back too soon, thinking that we can handle something, and then before you know it, you're back entangled with the very thing you thought you was free from. That's why you got to be led. But there are certain times in your life the Spirit of God will lead you to come face to face with your past because some of the things that happened to us and things we have experienced in life, my God, you have to deal with in order to move forward. And so when God is trying to give you a key to unlock something that has you in prison from your past, that's why you got to get alone. So God can say strategically how to handle 
this situation, how to make that phone call, how to revisit that situation, how to revisit that uncle that touched you, how to revisit that husband that mishandled you, and then it went on. Come on. See, God will give you weapons. He will give you strategic tools and keys, my God, on how to unlock things that have held you in prison from your past. But you got to be led. And so when you get along with God and get in that quiet place, God will speak to you and say, now go handle it like this. Say this to him. Say this to her. Do this. Go now. We've been trying to do it on our own. Not by my night, more by my power, by his spirit. You got to be led by the spirit of God when God wants you to encounter things from your past. How many of y'all try to go back to your past and fix something and it didn't turn out right? Let me see your hand. See, God is speaking. Because you have to be led. The Bible said the spirit of God told you, led God into the wilderness to be tempted. And so there's some things that you're going to have to come face to face with. I was taking a shower today and and I began to go back in my mind to my drug addiction. And I began to pause. I began to pause in the shower. And I thought about my wife sitting on the front row. And I just paused while I was taking a shower, getting ready to come to church. And I said to my wife, and she's just not hearing this, forgive me. Let me tell you why I said that. Because as I was praying this message, God took me back and reminded me of the person that I was. And I felt my wife's pain, Chaplain Sharon, when I was sick. This happened about five something. And I felt your pain when your husband was sick. I just bowed my head in the shower and let the water run on me. God gave me a glimpse of my past, just like that as I got ready to stand before y'all today. Why did I say that? Because some of us, I'm not going to give you a pass. I'm telling you, when the Spirit of God is ready, God is going to take you back to revisit some things because it's part of your crossing over. It's part of your healing. It's part of your transition. Because if you don't face some things, you'll never be able to transition right. How you come out of how you end one season, how you begin another season. I don't know why God allowed me to visit that. I don't have too many flashbacks of the former unless I'm in worship and then I hit a vein and there I go, come on somebody. But that, went, that happened to me. He took me back and I began to gr- grieve. I had to shake myself, my God, when I began to thank Brother Boyd, the person that I was and the pain that I caused. And I shook it off and I kept on doing what I had to do. Come on, somebody. But the very thing, why did I say it? Because the very thing that you fear is the very thing you're going to have to confront. Write that down. That's a principle right there. But see, when, the, when God, God will have you confront that when you're ready. Even though you fear it now, I'm sorry, but you're going to have to face it sooner or later. You can pray it away. You can fast for 100 days. That don't mean nothing. When God says it's time to face it, you're going to have to face it. There is some things you will have to face. Why do I say that? Because it's going to bring healing to you. Yes, sir. It happened in your past, and it ain't time to face it, but God going to send you. Oh, my God, I see y'all ladies. God going to send you back when it's time to face it because you have to come face to face with that yeah. so you can move forward in your future. Am I helping anybody so far? Yes, Amen. So the very thing you fear is the very thing that you need. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When, when we are alone and still, it is easier for us to hear the Lord when he is speaking to us. If we are going to be strong, church, in the Lord, then we must find time to be alone. Find time to get off the hustle, get out the hustle and bustle of life. Come off, as all y'all heard me say, come off the battlefield. Go into the barracks and say la. You and I have to fight for time alone because if you look at our schedules, you look at our responsibilities, or you in a 24-hour day, my God, we just can't find time. But it's vital to your existence. It's vital to your healing. It's vital to your future. It's vital to your healthiness. It's vital to your wholeness that you get alone. So the very thing, my God, that is vital to our existence as Christians, my God, we don't do. Okay, okay. Y'all don't believe me. Oh, my God. 
Write down Matthew 14. Matter of fact, I'm going to turn to it. Matthew 14. See, if our Lord and Savior thought it was enough, 14 started in verse number 13. As soon as Jesus heard the news, he left in a boat to a remote area to be alone. This is after he's getting ready to deal with the 5,000. After he heard the news of John the Baptist, the death of John the Baptist. Come on, somebody. He said he went to a remote place to be alone. And then in verse 23, Matthew 14, 23, it says, after sending them home, my God, after he had fed the 5,000, he went up into the hills by himself and prayed. Night fell while he was there all alone. And so Jesus, even our Lord and Savior, modeled, my God, the importance of being alone. Even after, my God, God used him, my God, with this, him used himself, my God, he, he heard the news of John the Baptist, so he went to a remote place to pray. And then after he fed the 5,000, not including the women and children, come on somebody, the Bible says he got in the boat and he went to be alone. See, that's what you mean? That's a time of refreshing. When you get alone, you got to refocus. When you get alone, you got to recharge. Come on. When you get alone, you need a refreshing, as I just said. Come on, somebody. You need to get alone so you can refocus. You can get refreshed. You can get revised. Are y'all with me so far? If our Lord and Savior had to do it after he did miracles, think about that. John the Baptist, who, who baptized him, John the Baptist tried to deter Jesus and say, my God, I need you to baptize me. And Jesus said, no, 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 this must take place, my God. Jo Jesus couldn't even do his earthly ministry until John the Baptist baptized him. See, it was part of the plan, my God. John the Baptist was, was, was supposed to baptize Jesus. Even when John tried to deter Jesus, Jesus said, no, this must happen. This must take place. Jesus couldn't even do his earthly ministry until John the Baptist did his right, ministry, right, right. his assignment. His assignment was to baptize our Lord and Savior. And so Jesus said, no, this got to happen. And so John the Baptist baptized, my God, our Lord and Savior, God in the flesh. And then, my God, John the Baptist, of course, in the story, was beheaded. Come on. And the Bible says when Jesus heard the news in Matthew 14, the Bible says he went to a remote place to get alone. After he fed the 5,000, not including the women and children, my God, he was tired in the flesh. He went to get alone. Is anybody tired? Okay, okay. So why are you not getting alone? If you if you really that tired, then get alone. Mm, mm, mm. Point number two. Also, too, Jacob was alive. Why God was dealing with him, he was alive. You're gonna like this. Mm-hmm. So did everybody understand the importance of getting alone? That God set Jacob up to be alone because he was doing something. I can go into the, the, to, to the, to the, the real story of it, my God, but for the second time, I can't mess with it. But there's strategic, it was a strategic point in Jacob's life is the reason why it was time. After 20 years of God working with Jacob, him being a trickster and all of those type of stuff, God said, now it's time for me to execute a father will in your life. Yes. I don't want to get ahead of myself. But he was alive. As Jacob prayed that night, the angel was, an, was, was unable to overcome Jacob. At the time, of course, we know that God could overtake Jacob in the story for real, but he allowed Jacob to fight to bring him to a place where he was willing to see himself as he truly is. God wrestled with him. He fight with the angel. We know the angel is God in the story. But God trying to get you and I alone. And he will wrestle with us until we get to the point where we see ourselves for who we really are. Can I help all of us? We ain't what we think we is. We all need to have a little talk with Jesus. We all got some things that we need to work on. We all got some things that we need to Change. Are y'all with me so far? Yes. And so God wrestled with Jacob. Of course, we know that God didn't have to wrestle with Jacob. Get the moral of the story. God is wrestling with some of you right now because God can break you if he wants to immediately. But he's allowing you to, he's shadow boxing with you like, uh, you hit one. Uh, uh. 
He boxing with you. He messing with you. He keeping his hands on you. Even when you slapping him down, he, he keep putting his hands back on you. My God, he's messing with you because God got a plan for you because remember, your destiny was already created. He's just preparing you for your destiny. That's what he's doing with Jacob. My God, he's wrestling with Jacob because he's getting Jacob ready for the next. Come on. He getting him ready for the next. At this point in time, Jacob represents his fleshly nature. See, he ain't been converted yet. That's why he fighting. When you find yourself always fighting with God, you're dealing and you're fighting from your flesh, not from your spirit. Come on, because the spirit is submit to God, my God. And so Jacob was fighting, my God, from his fleshly nature. God hadn't dealt with it. He ain't had that personal encounter yet, Patrice, my God. And so he was fighting God by his flesh and with his flesh. Like some of us, all of us, thank you, Holy Ghost, all of us, uh, we fighting God. Mm. It's all of us got some Jacob in us right now. Some of us is fighting right now. God already told you, but you telling yourself he didn't say that. That was my flesh. That wasn't God. Yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah. Anything that God, anything that your flesh, I mean your spirit tell you to do, is going to always point you to God and not take you away from God. Mm -hmm. So he's fighting, my God, from his fleshly man. Uh, my God, this also represents our sinful nature. As I told you, my God, God said it is finished. And so therefore we choose to commit sin. You and I don't have to wake up every day and habitually live in sin. You and I do not have to be dominated every day by the things of this world. My God, come on somebody, we choose. Sinning habitually is a choice. Being dominated by the stuff of this world is a choice. Making excuses about your life all the time is a choice. Always blaming somebody for your problems is a choice. Always blaming the white man, the black man for your problems is a choice. Always blaming your wife for your problems, men, is a choice. Oh. Always pointing the finger self-righteous women is a choice. Always going to Facebook trying to make it look like you all that, my God, but we know your life ain't what it profess to be. That's a choice. Oh, uh, my God. Yeah, yeah. We sound alone, my God, when we get a little bit of, uh, come on, somebody. Oh, but don't forget what it was when you needed your brother and your sister, when you needed the church, my God, to help you out with that right there. Don't forget where you come from. My God, it's a choice. Some of us is choosing to stay physically and mentally sick. A lot of our physical problems because our, we, we got problems in our mind. Mind controls the body. So some of us is sick in our body because we sick in our mind. This is Bible study. This is not Sunday morning. Somebody give God a hand. So Jacob, Jacob, let me move a little further. Jacob is fighting my God and wrestling with God from his flesh. God trying to break him. And of course, again, as I stated, we know that God could have instantly and he could instantly break you and I. He could instantly heal you at the same time as him breaking you. But sometimes he got to wrestle. You know why? Because he's trying to build your yeah. testimony. Yeah. Yeah. Come on, sir. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's why God don't do some things immediately, Dominique. Some things he allow to drag. Some things he allow to follow behind you. Even some sins, the Bible says he will allow my God to follow you. Come on, somebody, because when God do it, everybody going to know it wasn't nobody but God that did it. Mm. Mm. Understand this right here to bring some context. Our fleshly sinful nature is always fighting against the will of God. If you find yourself right now under the sound of my voice, oppressed, frustrated, angry, bitter. Ask yourself why. What has God asked you to do that you are wrestling with him about? Because all of us are wrestling to some capacity. Have God told you to forgive somebody but you don't want to? So you're wrestling. Have God asked you to go apologize to somebody but you don't want to so you're wrestling. What are you wrestling with right now? What has God asked you to do when it comes to, let me take it up off the flesh, let me take it to the spiritual realm. What spiritual accolades is God asking you to accomplish? What is God asking you to do spiritually? Because it don't always consist of a platform. What is this, y'all? We don't understand the power into shoveling Another word for shoveling sheep dung is serving. 
People will not serve unless they're being acknowledged. We had over 1,500 plus people come through this campus on Saturday. And the few people that came, for whatever reason, there are some that I see that didn't even come. I'm not trying to make nobody feel bad, but ask yourself, why come I didn't really come? Yeah. Uh -oh. yeah. Ask yourself, why come I didn't come support the own church yeah. that feeds me? Yeah. T.D. Jake said, you got to feed what's feeding you. And there's some that I see tonight that didn't even come. Whether you was out of town, I'm not talking to you. If you was at work, I'm not talking about you. But if you was in this city yeah. and wasn't nothing wrong with you, ask yourself why you didn't come. Right. It goes back to what I just said, flesh yeah. and sin. Because what you did is just talk yourself out of being obedient to the house. Yeah. I'll make it where you understand it. Simplicity. This is Bible study. Ask yourself why come you didn't come out and support. Yeah. Over 1,500 people that hit this campus. If you was at work, out of town, or something like that, then the Spirit of God ain't talking to you. But if you just chose not to come for whatever reason, then God is talking to you. Yeah. Flesh got in the way. Animosity got in the way. Bitterness got in the way. Jealousy got in the way. See, this is all the stuff that Jacob is wrestling with and God trying to get out of Jacob so he can prepare for where he's going. And God is wrestling with you trying to get that stuff out of you so he can prepare you where you're going. Y'all don't want to go with me. Y'all don't want to go with me. Y'all don't want to go with me. Y'all still stuck on pastor saying I didn't come. Instead of learning the principle behind what the Spirit of God is saying to you. God is wrestling with you and I because he's trying to get some stuff out of us that's hindering us from reaching our destiny. And so God would ask you to do stuff that don't make sense to the natural mind. God would challenge you, my God. When you say, God, I want to love more, then guess what? God going to put you in a situation where your love got to be exercised and in action. Come on, somebody. I want more faith than God going to say, put you in a situation where you need to exercise your faith. So you praying and asking God for stuff and he's trying to do it for you, but you're fighting him. Picking and choosing what you're going to do and when you're going to do it. Fighting God. But you're praying about everything and you want everything, but you won't utilize nothing that God's trying to do to help you give you what you're asking for. This Bible study. One of the things that I want to try to convey is that I've been reading. And there is a lot of apostasy in the church. Apostasy. People are turning away. By the thousands. Big pastors, little pastors, no pastors, people in general are turning away. I was talking to Pastor Dean and T.D. Jakes made a statement. He'd been really speaking. Never in the history of his generation have he seen the body of Christ so illiterate when it comes to biblical foundation. We don't read. People are leaving and being tricked. The pool pits are being used to entertain. People's faith is not built on, I mean, people's life is not built on faith. It's built on entertainment. It's built on excitement. And so, therefore, when the enemy come, when life come, when trials come, we have no foundation to resist. I seen, a, I seen something that grieved me. Oh, I'm in the spirit. It was a post that I seen. He said, there's two reasons why we should be happy about this weekend. And I won't call no name. This is what somebody said to greet me. Two reasons why we should be happy as a church, I'm paraphrasing, to protect the name and myself. The first reason why the person said is because such and such is back in town. The second reason is, I can't remember, but the second reason was for whatever it was. But what got me, no reason was because Christ is back. Our Christ is there. That vexed my soul. Two reasons to be happy. I don't care if you're looking. It's because he's back in town and for whatever other reason is. That's the reason why you should be happy this weekend to come to this church. Nobody said because Christ is here, because your transformation is here, or your encouragement is here. My God, it's because he's in town. 
This is how far, Mama Donna, we as people has drifted. People, my God, thank you, Holy Ghost. That's why, oh my God, I'm in another place right now. That's why, my God, the Spirit of God had me tell y'all, I'm not God and neither is she. I can't do it. God can only do it. I'm not God. I am not God and I cannot change your life. Only God can change your life. Oh my God, don't ever worship me. Worship the God who created me. And it grieved my soul. Because he's back in town. That's why you should come to church. It never said because Christ is at my church. That vexed my soul. Thousands of people's soul is printed on the entertainment of a man. Don't you ever worship me like that. Everybody online, don't you ever worship pastor people without pastor Michelle. I know nobody in this church more than you worship Christ. If you invite somebody to church, you tell them Christ is at going home for Christ church. Not because the pastor is back in town. Ah, not because the pastor is back in town. That's why you come to church. The devil is alive. Going home for Christ, worship Christ for me. Give God some glory for me. Oh, I'm going to teach you right, baby. I'm going to teach you right. I know it's uncomfortable to the flesh, but it's Bible. I know your flesh don't like it, but it's Bible. Going home for Christ, worship God for me, baby. Yeah. Some of them are stuck, but that's okay. Some of them can't even clap. That's okay. I need my sons and daughters to clap. Give God some glory. Oh, I'm watching. Because you want to be entertained. I want to talk to some people that love Jesus. Or oh, whether Pastor People is hurt, whether Michelle is hurt, we're going to worship God. We don't come to worship no man. Yes, he is. He's worthy. Shift the atmosphere of God. Thousands and thousands of people are being hurt and wounded behind the pool pit. Amen. Amen. Worship Jesus. Because he's back in town. The devil is a lie, Jill. But I asked somebody. Yes, go ahead and have a seat. Thank you. Just let me get that up off of me. Uh, that's apostolic. As I was telling the man of God, my God, yeah, you can't hold this man of God to what he was 20 years ago. You got to grow up and follow me in the spirit. No longer Egypt in the club. There's going to be a whole lot of things decreed in the atmosphere that you're not accustomed to pastor saying because you used to be dealing with the club. Well, we passed that. We're in Canaan now. We're in freedom now. We got to go on and possess the land now. Cut away the flesh. Get up out of sin. Don't possess the land now. Push farther into freedom. Push farther into deliverance. Push farther into healing. Hey, my God, you are conquerors. You are more than conquer us. Quit being dominated and start dominating it. Yes, I'm not going to give you a pass and talk about God no more. Heart. No, get healed. Get delivered. Push forward. Hallelujah. The fleshy nature and the sinful nature, my God, these natures, my God, are stubborn. Our fleshly nature, because we're talking about Jacob still alive. He's wrestling with the angel, and he's alive. He was alone, but he's still alive. I'm going to pick us up and get us out of here. And so our fleshly neighbor, nature right now is stubborn, unyielding. We're always fighting. Our fleshly nature is self-sufficient. That's why Zechariah 4 6 says, not by my might nor by my power, but by his spirit. Yeah. See, we got to get to the point where the spirit of God has dominion yeah. and is in control of our lives. When the Spirit of God is in control of our lives, we take our hands off the sternum wheel. And then we trust God even when we can't trace it. And then we go blind. If we got to go, we go blind. Sometimes God got to take you blind. Oh, my God, you got to be the following. My God, oh, my God, I feel like preaching now. Sometimes you got to go blind, Toya. You don't know, but God got you. He, he, uh, you got to go blind sometimes. You got to do it, as the wives you say, you got to do it afraid sometimes. You got to go and won't nobody else go. You got to get up and won't nobody else get up. You got to show up and won't nobody else show up. Come on, somebody. God ain't going to take you by the hand on everything. God, going, he going to let you go and say, okay, now walk out there. Trust me. Walk on out there. God. Take me at my word. Do you believe me or do you don't believe me? Are you with me or are you not with me? Get on out there. I got you. Cross on over to the other side. I got you.
trying to build your faith. Trying to build your faith. God is trying to break a lot of our stubbornness. Including the pastor as well. He's trying to get us to yield to his spirit. And try to always fighting against him. Many of us is frustrated. And we got a lot of agitation. And we angry. We feel defeated, my God. Because we fighting against the will of the Father. That's why you got to have our love with Pastor Teresa. Say you got to have an eternal yes. There's too much stuff on top of our yes. God ain't going to tell you everything. He ain't going to show you and I everything. We got to ask God to break our flesh, crucify our sinful nature. Sin is killing the body of Christ. Sin is killing our lives. Sin is causing us all kind of unnecessary pain. You don't have to commit sin. We choose to sin. And I'm not saying none of us is perfect. But at the end of the day, there's some things, my God, we understand we were shaped in, in, in iniquity. We understand we was born with a sin nature, but we don't have to be dominated by our sin nature. Read the book of Romans, the 6, 7, and 8. You got dominion over that stuff. You can choose to say no. If he call you at 1 o'clock, I ain't going. If you got an alcohol problem, I ain't drinking. You can make a choice not to do it. You don't have to be bitter. You can't forgive. You can't let him go. You can't let her go. You can't forgive your husband. You can't forgive your ex-husband. You can't forgive your baby's mama. You can't forgive that man. It's a choice. I said before you, life and death, blessed and cursed to choose life. A lot of us are choosing death over life. That's Bible. I set before you a choice. God says choose life. I set before you a choice. Choose life. God said you got blessing and curses, life and death, and then he tells you choose life. Oh, he tells you what to choose. Uh, he don't leave it up to you. He make it for you because he knows we can't trust ourselves, so he tell you what the answer is. Choose life. You don't have to continue to choose death. You don't have to leave church tonight and go choose that fleshly death. We too alive in the body of Christ. That's why we pick and choose what we do and what we don't do. That's we too alive. That's why we don't read when we should be reading. We don't pray when we should be praying. We too alive. We are too alive. I didn't say you. I said we are too alive. Jacob was wrestling with God from his fleshly nature. Oh, my God. God can't deal with you and I from our flesh. Flesh birth flesh and spirit birth spirit. Mm. God is trying to get us from being so self-sufficient. Many of us are just like Jacob. We fight the Lord on every turn in our lives. God will tell us something is wrong, and the fleshly nature rebels against the Lord's truth. The Bible will tell you, it ain't so, and you are trying to tell God it is so. I was talking to the woman of God. People are compromising the standard. It's okay. God know your heart. Girl, ain't nobody going to know. Well, he should be treating you better. Then you wouldn't have to do that. If he would handle his business as a man, you would have to get him to help you pay your bill. See, wow. the, in the church. Oh, wow. Everywhere. Because the foundation in a lot of believers' lives is cracked. That's why the Bible says, seek first the kingdom. Don't seek a platform. Don't seek and worship man or woe man. Worship God, the creator. Mm -hmm. we, God will tell us something is right, and we'll say that's Old Testament. That don't apply. Did God really say that? Come on, Eve. Did God really say that? Yeah, he said it. This is God in words form. Ain't nothing about this outdated. Nothing. I'm taking an Old Testament principle, my God, and making it revelatory for right now. So how is the word outdated? The same wrestling, the same battles that Jacob was having over 2,000 years ago, we got them same battles right now. Look how we taking the Spirit of God is taking something that happened in Genesis in the beginning and bringing it up to right now, 2019. And we all are dealing with some level of wrestling with God because of our sinful nature. So don't tell me the Bible's outdated. Don't tell me the Bible's not revelatory for now. This is what people are saying. Pay attention. All that don't matter no more. That's old. It's outdated. 
Come on, somebody. Some of us is entertaining that right now. Apostolic. Lord, help the people of God. Don't let our flesh interfere. Help us to die. We fight the Lord, as I said, on every turn. Romans 7, 15, write this down. Let's push forward. I don't really understand, Paul said myself. For I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Paul said, instead, I do what I hate. Romans chapter 7, verse 15. Let me show you the revelation, Pastor Champ. Here is the second greatest preacher in the world history. The second, Apostle Paul. The second greatest baby and most powerful person that ever walked this earth other than Jesus. And Paul says, who wrote over two-thirds, woman of God, first-time guest, who wrote over half of the New Testament. Ha, the second greatest preacher. Other than Christ. He said, he said, he said, Brian, watch this now. Watch the revelation. Watch the revelation. The second greatest, I'm emphasizing it because I want us to get the revelation. The second greatest preacher mm. next to Christ. That's heavy right there. We talking yeah, about the Bible. Because yeah, yeah, Jeremiah, yeah. Isaiah, them, uh, and uh, Nehemiah, them some powerful men of God. But Paul, Paul, Paul the Paul. second greatest, he said, that what I'm supposed to do, I don't do. Yeah, yeah. That what I don't want to do, I find myself doing it. Yeah. So here's somebody that wrote this. Yeah. Said, I'm in a cold blooded battle. Uh-huh. I got something going on. Oh, it's gonna take God to help me. <laughs> oh my God. Oh my God. He said, he said, he said, that's what I don't want to do, I find myself doing. So, 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 what makes you think, what makes I think, me think, my God, that I don't need to die? That that I'm greater than Paul? He said, he said, he, he let us read it again. Mm. Oh, Lord. He, he said, I don't really understand myself. He didn't wrote half of the New Testament. Oh, my God. He had an encounter, Acts the ninth chapter. He had a face-to-face encounter with God like Jacob did. Come on, somebody. He ended up writing half of the Bible. And he said, my God, I don't understand myself. After he wrote all this to you, I don't understand myself. That what I'm supposed to do, I don't do. And that what I don't want to do, I do. He said, I'm troubled. Oh, Lord, deliver me, he Paul said. This is a cold battle we in. And you think you ain't got to stay on the altar. And you think you ain't got to read your Bible. And you think you ain't got to pray. And you think you ain't got to fast. Just to hear, my God, oh, to overcome this mess. I was on a consecration all day today. I got to have it to survive. Here's a man that wrote half for the Bible. Sola, he told me, I, don't, I, I, I be doing stuff I ain't supposed to be doing. But we act like we ain't got to read the Bible. Pray. That's, that's, that's elementary stuff I'm talking about. You're supposed to do that because you love God. If you say you love him. Paul said, I don't know what's wrong with me. He, I, so I challenge you to ask yourself. I'm back to tonight. I'm going to challenge you. Who is alive? Ask yourself, who is alive? Who's alive? Uh Uh-huh. The old man or the new man? Who's alive? Apostle Paul had a struggle. I know I got one. See, I didn't came face to face with myself. I had to do it all the time. Every time you read the Bible, you come face to face with yourself. Some people don't want to read it because they don't really want to know. So it gives them an excuse to live in sin. I said some people don't want to read it because they don't want to know because they give you an excuse to live in sin. Who's alive? I'm prefaces, not condemning. Why you wasn't here, sir, then? That'll tell you who was alive. If you wasn't at work, you wasn't out of town, you wasn't sick, you just didn't come. That, that right there, I just helped you. The blessings and curses, Life and death, choose life. I just helped you. If you wasn't at work, you wasn't in the hospital, you wasn't out of town, it's your only day off. You talk yourself out of coming to support something that you belong to. Feed what's feeding you. I ain't talking about the church. It was, it was a thousand plus people that come to it that needed something that you had. But you let your flesh tell you to stay home. I'm making it revelatory. Old Testament principle, New Testament application. Why? Because I'm trying to help the body. So who's alive? The old man or the new man? Do you constantly find yourself fighting against the Lord? 
Do you constantly find yourself? Are y'all listening to me up there, men? Alvin and Stephen, are y'all listening to me? Who's alive? Do you constantly find yourself fighting against God? Women, men, do we find ourselves constantly fighting? We know what we're supposed to do. We don't do it. I'm guilty. See, I'm just keeping it on the dollar. There's things that I got to do that sometimes I wrestle with doing. There's things I need to do, and sometimes I wrestle with doing. So I ain't throwing nobody under the... I'm just real enough to keep it on the dollar. Who's alive? Mm -hmm. Do you find yourself acting stubbornly when you're faced with God's plan? What has God told you to do and he already showed you? This is what you call to do, but you won't do it. What have God showed you inside this church that you should be doing and you still have not done it? What excuses are you constantly making because you got offended? Uh, you didn't like the person that was the department coordinator, and so you just stubbornly stepped down, and you just been sitting down on God. You heard, but you're not heard. You're hurting yourself more than you heard the church, because the church is going on. Old Testament principle, New Testament application. Stubbornness. What have God asked you to do that you're not doing? Who is alive in you, the flesh or the Lord? Let's look again at Romans, the same guy I've been talking about, and I'm done. In Romans chapter 6, 6 through 7, uh, champ, he, says, uh, he says, Paul said, we know that our old sinful nature was crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power. Now he's picking us up in our lives. See, this is how you know who's more alive when the stuff that used to dominate you ain't dominating you no more. The things we used to do, we ain't doing no more. That's when you know sin is losing its grip. Sin is losing its power. Oh, you got dominion over it instead of it having a dominion over you. And if you are still dominated, encourage yourself. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Encourage yourself. But let me help you through the scripture. Don't give yourself a pass to be dominated by something that you have the power over. He was altered, number three. Let's close. He was altered. He was alone, he was alive, some of us got to die, all of us got to die, all of us got to die, and when we die, then we become altered. <sighs> this one night in the life of Jacob was the culmination of 20 years of patient activity by the Lord, and for the second time I can't mess with it. Because God, Jacob was something else, man. And God patiently waited for 20 years to get him to this point. 20 years. See, for us, 10 is a generation. In the Bible, 40 is a generation. 40, 40 years. God waited. The Bible says uh, Moses' life is a series of 40s. 40 years in the, in, uh, in the wilderness, 40 years of training, 40 years in the promised land. 80, 120, I mean. And so God waited 20 years. Listen to me, y'all. Oh, my God. I'm trying to... <laughs> he waited after he got him alone, after he began to speak to his sin nature, he began the process of changing. He waited 20 years to get him here. Now, we know God didn't have to wait no 20 years. God is patiently executing his will in your life. He got to let you get to the point to where you where you like me. You're sick and tired of really being sick and tired. And when you understand it's life or death. And so that's why I hold on to the horns of the altar like I do. That's why I'm so desperate for the Lord because I understand it's life or death. And so 20 years of God patiently waiting. Patiently waiting for you to answer the call that's on your life. For you to submit to the things that God wants you to do. 20 years for you to say Yes, God, I trust you. Yes, God. Some of us have been holding on to unforgiveness for 20 years. Some of us have been bitter over 50 plus years. God is patiently waiting. Old Testament principle, New Testament application. Woo, my God. I got to give it to you. 20 years. We, 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 we want instant everything today. Instant coffee, instant gratification. Yet there's one thing for sure. Instant holiness you'll never find. 
You'll never find instant holiness. It's a process. The Bible said while we're being sanctified, while we're being saved. That's why you got to let God keep his hands on you. That's why you got to stay on the potter's wheel. That's why you got to keep that constitution open. That's why you got to stay on your face. That's why you got to push back social media. That's why you got to push back your plate. That's why you got to get away from people, my God, and get alone with God. Because God got things he want to say to you. He got things he's trying to do in your life. He's trying, he trying to make, my God, the next 20 years better than the last 20. He's trying, he trying, he trying to make the next day better than yesterday. But you won't get alone. You won't get alone with him. Come on. And so, my God, God waited 20 years for this time. Oh, my God. Uh, uh, it, 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 it's always, talking about, talking about holiness, always a result of prayer and sacrifice and self-denial. We in the body of Christ in the world today, we don't want to deny ourselves nothing. That's why the three points, lust of the eye, pride of life, and lust of the flesh. If you look at a lot of stuff that we got going on, it's from those three points, right? The lust of the eye, pride of life, and lust of the flesh. We want it, and we want it now. And so, therefore, all we do, <laughs> Lord, help me, because we want so much stuff, we just keep rolling over. Uh, when they give you them cards, and they just roll over, and, and you get six months, no interest, and all we just rolling over, rolling over, roll, a perpetual web. For the moment. For the moment. Instant gratification. When you have a head on collision with God, a lot of stuff that used to matter, ladies and gentlemen, don't matter no more. A lot of desires that we have begin to die. A lot of our likes begin to die. Our perception begins to change. Our outlook begins to change. Our love begins to increase. Our pride is supposed to die more and more and more. Come on, somebody. Things change when God has a head on collision with you. And so prayer helps alter you. Self-sacrifice helps alter us. And then making personal sacrifices. Can I help you with this? Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Quit trying to make everybody else Make a sacrifice, but you won't make one. You want everybody else you might say, to, 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 to adjust and adapt to your life, but you won't adjust and adapt. God trying to break that. God trying to break that. God always takes his time in bringing us to spiritual maturity. Oh, my God. He gently and patiently leads us alone. And brings us to a place where, 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 where we can be filled and used for his glory. He, he gently brings us along. He know what to do. He know what to do. Uh, Jacob at this point was a broken man. He was clinging. Jacob is no longer fighting, y'all. At this point, my God, he's alone. He was alive. But now he's broken. Now he's broken. Oh, my God. And yet he's holding on. My God, uh, he, he's holding on. Jacob is holding on to his blessing. He said, I can't let you go till you bless me. See, at first he was trying to do everything by himself. If you know the story of Jacob, my God, he was a trickster. My God, he, he was doing all kind of stuff in his own strength, my God. But now he's at a point where he didn't have an encounter with God. And now, my God, he's been wrestling, and now he's a broken man. He's a broken man. When he stood up, my God, when he first encountered the angel, he was standing tall, Pastor, but he'd been wrestling all night. <laughs> Come on, and now God is steady, patiently breaking him down, oh, my God. And now he's at a point where, my God, he's holding on. At first he was fighting, now he's holding. Who, my God, have a little talk with Jesus. Oh, my God, some of us right now is at a place right now. We got one more fight, and then next we're going to hold on. We got one more fight in us. We got one more push in us. But the next thing, he going to break you. He going to break you. That's prophetically. I promise you, he going to break you. But he's, if we insist on fighting the Lord as he attempts to grow us, if we assist, insist on fighting the Lord as he attempts to grow us, he will eventually bring us to a place where all of our fight is gone. Keep on fighting. Remember, 20 years of wrestling, he's patient. I promise you, you and I are going to quit before God do. You and I are going to give up before God give up on you. Woo, Lord, thank you for not giving up on me. Oh, my God. Mm, mm, mm. You see, he knows. Watch this. Write this down. Come on, y'all. Stay with me. We're going to finish. He knows exactly where. He, 
He know where and how to touch you and I. He know where and how. Give it to me. Touch him right there. Touch him right there. Take that from him. Close that door. He had his hope set on that opportunity, but close it. He depended on that person, but I'm finna move that person now. What he thought was gonna happen ain't gonna happen. Let me give you some scripture. Many are the plans of a man's heart, but it's the Lord's will that will prevail. He know where to touch you. He know where to use star and first lady. He know where to touch us. He know how to make us feel it when he's trying to break us. He know what to take from you, Jill. He know what to take from you, Stacy. He know what pleasure I need to say to you to make you think about something. He know what to do, Michelle. I'm coming in. He know what to do, Kenny. He got everything under control in Arizona. Yeah. Trust him. Amen. Submit and obey. Take her business on this end here. Take her business on that end. Promise you. That's Bible. Amen. Take her my business. Seek first my kingdom and he'll take her everything else. That's Bible. Matthew 6, That's your scripture for tonight. Read it. Get revelation. And watch what happened on that end. Amen. He know where to touch you at. He know how to touch you. Who need to be touched? Okay. 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 I'm going to jump on in. He, he was a broken man, and he was a blessed man. That's it. After God broke him, he blessed him. He changed his name. When God said, when the angel said, uh, well, what is your name and all that, God knew who he was. God was dealing with Jacob's character. Because Jacob was a trickster. He was a deceiver. He was a planter. See, God was taking Jacob and getting Jacob prepared to go to a place where the trail of tribes will be birthed. Are you following me now, my brother? I was going to get there. Thank you for some students. God had to prepare him and clean up his character. That's why he changed his name. Israel, peace, and prince. Jacob was a trickster. He was a liar. God had to deal with his character like he's dealing with mine and yours. And he's trying to break you and I. And he know where to touch you at. He know who to touch and who to you to touch you. God had to break Jacob before he blessed him. You want the blessing without the character. You want the blessing without the breaking. Can't get around it, baby. Yeah. Yeah. You want the blessing, but you don't want the breaking. You want the blessing, well, you don't have the integrity and the character for the platform. And the platform is not preaching for the promotion. You want the husband, but you ain't healed from the last one. The Bible says what we sow, we reap. Some of our beings are still are blessed to have our fathers that we don't talk to. And we wonder why our sons don't talk to us. Want the blessing without the breaking. God's trying to get some of us alone because Jacob was too alive. But after he had an encounter with God, he was altered. God changed his life. Jacob had, truth be told, had been fighting with God way before he had this encounter with God. Some of us have been fighting a long time. But it's time for an encounter. And it's so strategic that God would have me talk about encounters and face-to-face -face when we're getting ready next month to go on an encounter. Everything is strategic. All of us need to be signed up and registered for the men's and women's encounter because we all are too alive. We all need to die so that we can be blessed. I don't know about y'all, but I need everything yeah. that God has for me. Yeah. For so some of us, whatever you do, Kendall will be at the lobby, the resource that's ready to receive you. Are you ready to be broken? Because you can't be blessed until you be broken. God had to prepare Jacob for the future. He changed his name from Jacob to Israel. 
God is into the name changing. He changed Saul to Paul. Are you ready for your name to change? I'm sorry, and I'm through. Let me close it. You're not going to get that next blessing until you get that next breaking. So you determine how long it's going to take. 